Chapter 29 My dear Wormwood, Now that it is certain that the German humans will bomb your patient's town, and that his duties will keep him in the thick of danger, we must consider our policy. Are we to aim for cowardice, or at courage, with consequent pride, or at hatred of the Germans? Well, I'm afraid it's no good trying to make him brave. Our research department has not yet discovered, though success is hourly expected, how to produce any virtue. This is a serious handicap. To be greatly and effectively wicked, a man needs some virtue. What would Attila have been without his courage? Or Shylock without self-denial as regards the flesh? But as we cannot supply these qualities ourselves, we can only use them as supplied by the enemy. And this means leaving him a kind of foothold in those men whom otherwise we have made most securely our own. A very unsatisfactory arrangement, but I trust we shall one day learn to do better. Hatred. We can manage. The tension of human nerves during noise, danger, and fatigue makes them prone to any violent emotion, and it is only a question of guiding this susceptibility into the right channels. If conscience resists, muddle him. Let him say that he feels hatred not on his own behalf, but on that of the women and children and that a Christian is told to forgive his own, not other people's enemies. In other words, let him consider himself sufficiently identified with the women and children to feel hatred on their behalf, but not sufficiently identified to regard their enemies as his own, and therefore proper objects of forgiveness. But, Hatred is best combined with fear. Cowardice, alone of all the vices, is purely painful. Horrible to anticipate. Horrible to feel. Horrible to remember. Hatred has its pleasures. It is therefore often the compensation by which a frightened man reimburses himself for the miseries of fear. The more he fears, the more he will hate, and hatred is also a great anodyne for shame. To make a deep wound in his charity, you should therefore first defeat his courage. Now, this is a ticklish business. We have made men proud of most vices, but not of cowardice. Whenever we have almost succeeded in doing so, the enemy permits a war, or an earthquake, or some other calamity, and at once courage becomes so obviously lovely and important even in human eyes that all our work is undone. And there is still at least one vice of which they feel genuine shame. The danger of inducing cowardice in our patients, therefore, is lest we produce real self-knowledge and self-loathing with consequent repentance and humility. And in fact, in the last war, thousands of humans, by discovering their own cowardice, discovered the whole moral world for the first time. In peace, we can make many of them Ignore good and evil entirely. In danger, the issue is forced upon them in a guise to which even we cannot blind them. There is here a cruel dilemma before us. If we promoted justice and charity among men, we should be playing directly into the enemy's hands. But if we guide them in the opposite direction, this, sooner or later, produces, for he permits it to produce, a war or a revolution, and the undisguisable issue of cowardice or courage awakes 
thousands of men from moral stupor. This, indeed, is probably one of the enemy's motives for creating a dangerous world, a world in which moral issues really come to the point. He sees, as well as you do, that courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. A chastity, or honesty, or mercy, which yields to danger, will be chaste, or honest, or merciful, only on conditions. Pilate was merciful, until it became risky. It is therefore possible to lose as much as we gain by making your man a coward. He may learn too much about himself. There is, of course, always the chance, not of chloroforming the shame, but of aggravating it and producing despair. Oh, this would be a great triumph. It would show that he had believed in and accepted the enemy's forgiveness of his other sins only because he himself did not fully feel their sinfulness that in respect of the one vice which he really understands in its full depth of dishonor, he cannot seek nor credit the mercy. Ah, but I fear that you have already let him get too far into the enemy's school, and he knows that despair is a greater sin than any of the other sins which provoke it. As to the actual technique of temptations to cowardice, not much need be said. The main point is that precautions have a tendency to increase fear. The precautions publicly enjoined on your patient, however, soon become a matter of routine, and this effect disappears. What you must do is to keep running in his mind, side by side with the conscious intention of doing his duty. The vague idea of all sorts of things he can do or not do, inside the framework of the duty, which seem to make him a little safer. Get his mind off the simple rule, I've got to stay here and do so-and-so, into a series of imaginary lifelines. If A happens, though I very much hope it won't, I could do B, and if the worst came to the worst, I could always do C, superstitions, if not recognized as such, can be awakened. The point is to keep him feeling that he has something other than the enemy and the courage the enemy supplies to fall back on, so that what was intended to be a total commitment to duty becomes honeycombed all through with little unconscious reservations by building up a series of imaginary expedients to prevent the worst coming to the worst, you may produce, at that level of his will which he is not aware of, a determination that the worst shall not come to the worst. Then, at the moment of real terror, rush it out into his nerves and muscles and you may get the fatal act done before he knows what you're about. For remember, the act of cowardice is all that matters. The emotion of fear is in itself no sin. And though we enjoy it, it does us no good. Your affectionate uncle, Screw Tape.